Welcome to Star Talk, your place in the universe where science and pop culture collide. Star Talk begins right now. Star Trek Live! <laughs> Town Hall. The topic is food. Food, the science and technology of food on Earth and in space. I want to first introduce my co-host this evening. You all remember him from Comedy Central, Jordan Klepper. Jordan! Come on out! Hey, everybody! Good in. Hey, all good right. to see you. Hello, Excellent. everybody! Good to be Jordan. here. Good all to right. be here. Good to be here. We got you, and you've you've hosted uh, Klepper. Hosted the well-named Klepper on Is Comedy Central. It's the most Central. creative name you can it's come up with. It's the most creative name, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's a series of documentaries where you're exploring I explore topics this in America. Uh, with the, it turns out this is a strange country we live in. Yes. So I went really? out there. I talked to people. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you got to meet these people, Neil. They're very strange. So I've, I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of them. Excellent. Yes. Jordan Klepper. Excellent. So there we go. All right. So also joining us, in addition to the inimitable Jordan Klepper, is flavor scientist and food chemist, Dr. Ariel Johnson. Dr. Johnson, come on out. <laughs> Hi. Whoa. Thanks. <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> you have a PhD in viticulture and enology. Enology, yeah. At at UC Davis. That's that's where I went. Isn't that just code for <laughs> wine? <laughs> a lot of wine. Uh, we actually did a lot of studies of different beverages. So there was some gin, some tequila, a little bit of... Uh, beverages, <laughs> yes. <the> beverages. <laughs> and to be fair, Neil, I have a doctorate in scotch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doctorate. <laughs> and our feature guest this evening is the one and only Alton Brown. Alton Brown, come on out! <laughs> So let me fill in some of this bio. So, you ha hang tight for a minute. You you were like PhD. Oh shit! Ed really? Is that <laughs> what? <laughs> you're <laughs> you were PhD advisor <laughs> to the premier restaurant Noma in Denmark. Yes. That that's like one of the most premier restaurants ever. It, it did win best restaurant in the world a few times. Yeah. Under your watch? Sometimes. <laughs> that that's amazing. So you, this is a job. It, it is a job that I kind of invented. Um, when I was doing research in grad school, I went over there to see what they were up to and write some papers. And then I was like, hey, I'm available. Why don't you guys hire me? Because we're having such a great time. Great. We, that's great. <laughs> I want that job. Right. <laughs> right. And I'll you settle have, for a reservation. Yeah. <laughs> so, so She's also the science officer on a show called Good Eats. I heard about yeah. that. <laughs> I heard about that. That, that there's a show that even has somebody called a science officer. Good Eats. Yeah. <laughs> 14 years on Food Network. Good Eats. Um, that, was the, that was the original run. We actually just crossed 20 this year. Oh. Can I, can I ask her a quick question? Where is Flavor Rama in juxtaposition to Flavor Town? <laughs> <laughs> Are they close to each other? Uh, they, they are close to each other, but, but Flavorama has much better urban planning and an actual like sewer system. There you and, go. Uh, there you clean go. Clean water. <laughs> cool. And, and uh, we, we have you on this show because you're not just celebrity chef. You have made it a career to juxtapose, to cross-pollinate the fruits of science and its research into the food you prepare. Yes, sir. This is an important place to be as we go forward in this world. I believe that it is. You're but right. so, so what intrigues me about the two of you, especially since she's on your staff. Consulting <laughs> flavor rama -ist. Con Okay, yeah. this means detective. sort of on the staff. <laughs> Fine. Yeah. So, so you come to science from food, and she comes to food from science. 
could you both share with me how you how that what that trajectory was? You first. Oh, for me. Um, well, I was always super interested in food as a kid, um, to the point where like my grandmother was a really good cook, and I'd go over to her house, and she had this like amazing cookbook collection, and sometimes I would just like get on the floor and read them for hours, um, and I'd cook a lot. Um, then when I was like getting into getting like a bachelor's degree. Uh, it, it turned out you could do food and science together. It's um, a bachelor's degree. No, no, I was doing a bachelor's degree in chemistry. So I was super interested in chemistry. You're um, fundamentally a chemist. I am, yeah. All of my formal training is in chemistry. Good, okay. So, yeah. Um, it turned out that chefs were interested in science and scientists were interested in working with chefs. So I did some of that here at NYU and then um, found a graduate program that would let me continue. So uh, UC, Davis. UC Davis ended up out west. So Alton, how did you get to science from food? Um, I got to science from food by realizing that I wasn't a very good cook. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, how I got into I, comedy. Yeah, that's how you got into comedy. Um, I had uh, left... Wait, wait, you I have a left show on Food Network. Yeah, I do. And you just said yeah. you're not a good cook. Well, I used to... I'm better. It got, be it got better. <laughs> it, got better. Okay. it got better. But when I went off to culinary school, I had changed careers because I wanted to make a food show. And I got off to culinary school and realized, holy crap, I'm actually not very good at this. But what I figured out is that if I could understand the science of what was going on in the food, I could be a better cook. And so that was the tact that I, that I took with my show, which is that if we all just understand what it is the food freaking wants, <laughs> we can make it better. And the answer to that is almost always science. So you're saying, not to put words in your mouth, but anyone in the kitchen can become a better scientist with a dose of science literacy added to it. Yes, but they don't necessarily have to. You can become a better cook through science. You could definitely become a better scientist through cooking. Definitely. Um, but I don't think that you have to have science. There are people that are just great cooks. I'm not that. No, so that's not what I asked. <laughs> you get a great cook, now you add some science to their great cooking. Does their cooking get better? It can. I'm not going to say unilaterally that it will, because some people don't care, nor should they, because they're cultural cooks, maybe, and they, mm. they're, they're, they're cooking out of traditions. They don't have to understand what's going on. I trained under some really great French chefs. All they had to do was scream really loud. <laughs> <laughs> and the food was delicious. Wait, wait, so, so the, For the French, uh, that is a science. Yeah, she was like, <laughs> idiot! <laughs> That's part of the science. It's so yeah. goddamn good. Science of management. But it, it, I, I, do, I do think that, at least for me, and I think for, for, for American culture, certainly where we are, is, is that if, if you are willing to learn some science, it will make you a better cook. Hmm. Was that answering your question? Yeah. So you advised Noma Restaurant, at head of R&D. The idea that a restaurant would have an R&D head, that, that tickles me. And, <laughs> but what, what it particularly intrigues me is that this is in Denmark, and that restaurant is committed to local ingredients. Yeah, so like... So doesn't that greatly <laughs> limit what you can create? It, it, it is a huge and sometimes terrifying limitation. Um, I, I know the first year that they opened, this is before I got there, they were like, great, we're going to use seasonal Nordic produce. Um, and it was November, and their, their vegetable supplier came to the back door and was like, great, here's your seasonal Nordic produce. And it was like three beets and a carrot. <laughs> Um, but in many creative pursuits in the arts, I think that um, you know, creative constraints really help you be more creative. And so in that case, the constraint of having to source ingredients from the Nordic region, the Scandinavian region, which is very cold, has a very short growing season, not a lot of sunlight. There's no citrus there either. There's no citrus. No citrus, no olive oil, um, great dairy, but like a lot of fruits don't grow there. There's no wine that really... There. Other than that, it's a great restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get me on a plane. They, they have the finest reindeer piss. <laughs> but you can actually get the uh, reindeer moss from the inside of the reindeer's... Uh... No, stop that sentence. <laughs> where? Where? No, where? no. Stop that <laughs> sentence. Get flavor from the inside of the reindeer's... I don't want to hear the end of that sentence. <laughs> But yeah, so lemons don't grow in Denmark, so like... But just to be clear, mm -hmm. you just affirmed that reindeers do exist. Reindeers exist. They're a real yes. thing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> just want to be clear. <laughs> and something comes out of them. Yeah. Ver various things come out of them. <laughs> There's many gastronomic options. I'm never uh, going to Denmark. I am never, ever going to Denmark. <laughs> so you're saying that you, you, what you would do is 
is substitute what might be familiar uh, flavors with, with something else that approximates it. So yeah. any, any good examples of um, that? Well, Actually, one thing, so like cooking tends to be better if you have some acidity. Um, it just like brightens up all the flavors and a lot of chefs like to use lemons for that. Um, if you don't have access to lemons, it turns out that the, uh, well, the native European forest ant, Formica rufa, um, they're called Formica because they produce a lot of formic acid. So these are actually like tangy ants. Um, so by going into the forest, you know, looking for mushrooms or uh, berries or flower petals, you start tasting these ants, and you're like, wow, these are... You start tasting wait, the wait, ants. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> she just worked at a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, Ariel, you go, you rummage the forest floor for ants, <laughs> taste them to see if they will work in this world-class restaurant. I have done that, yes. Um, well, so it turns out these ants are very acidic. Um, we have, we have, at Noma we had friends that were chefs in other places in the world, like Brazil, who were experimenting with ants. Because it's, no, like the native Amazonian cuisine uses ants. Um, so we're like, well, why not try these ants that are swarming all over us? Um, <laughs> and it turns out, so ants are very acidic, so you can make this like quite acidic and refreshing ant paste that we would put on like a juniper and blueberry. It was good, it was really good. Um, Jordan, she used the word refreshing, didn't she? She did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to comment on that, but then yeah, she used yeah, the phrase yeah. ant You're not going to comment ant paste. <laughs> but, but also, it turns out that, um, so ants have a lot of pheromones. They use chemicals to signal with each other. So they have like what's called a chemical ecology. Um, and we were, you know, we were tasting these ants and like, yes, I know. And you're getting uh -huh. turned on by the ants. ants. Yeah. You're turned on by the ants. <laughs> But it turns out a lot of the chemicals that they use to communicate with each other are some of the same uh, volatile flavor molecules that are in herbs and flowers and uh, other is, tasty plants. Is this the foundation of molecular gastronomy? I've heard that term, <laughs> and frankly, yeah. I never really understood what it meant. I think a lot of people don't understand what well, it means. Well, that's why we have you here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so some, some people, some like journalists and stuff attach molecular gastronomy to certain styles of cooking. Technically speaking, molecular gastronomy is a field of study. Um, the basically paying attention to molecularly, the chemistry of everything that happens in food and cuisine. So in cooking and in growing food. Um, so it's related to food science, but- So um, you think about the difference between taste and smell. Oh yeah, all the time. So which, can you, uh, and, and flavor, what, can you mm -hmm. judge, is there one more important than the other? I, I, is there, uh, how much of our DNA uh -huh. gets directed to, uh, what can you tell us I about I can this? tell you a lot about that, actually. So, uh, although when we like eat something tasty and we experience the flavor, we think, we feel like that's happening in the mouth and is all taste, actually a huge amount of, of flavor comes from smell. Um, there's a process called retronasal olfaction. Um, retronasal <laughs> olfaction. <laughs> so that's in contrast to orthonasal olfaction. Of course. Um, of ortho course. We, we all knew that. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a cocktail up on Fort Worth. <laughs> <laughs> a rectal nasal olfaction. <laughs> I had one of those. Invasive. <laughs> Sounds like college. <laughs> um, orthonasal olfaction is sniffing. It's when you smell things. Well, why couldn't you just say What? Thank you. Because we have special words you. for them. <laughs> smell has one syllable yeah, last no. I checked. We can't really write in a paper like, today, this paper is about And there's sniffing. the problem with academia right <laughs> <laughs> Comic um, books, it's all we really but, need. All right, so what happens chemically when we taste something? So when we taste or when we smell something, there's molecules in your food. Um, it's full of molecules, it's made of molecules. Well, get some fresh stuff. <laughs> no, with, without molecules, there is no food. Okay, like, well, zoom let's in, ask a scientist. All of its molecules. You'll get my back on this. Molecules <laughs> all the way down. <laughs> Um, Some of my best friends are made of molecules, <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's the bumper sticker right there, buddy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you eat food. The food has a bunch of molecules. Um, some of them can bind to receptor proteins. Uh, these are proteins expressed on the outside of cells in our tongue and in our nasal cavity. So like the, the tongue. Like yeah, we, um, and the nasal cavity, which I can't show you, but it's this little patch of... You actually stick out, stuck out your tongue to tell us what your tongue is. Yeah. <laughs> but nasal, olfactal, whatever, you just said that and kept moving in the sentence. 
He's got. Well, I mean, I have I have the tongue demo ready. I I, I would okay. have to okay. crack open your skull and show this little patch, and then you'd be dead of uh, of uh, the olfactory epithelium. Um, so uh, molecules in the food, we have we have uh, taste receptors, but we also have um, the largest family of genes in our genome is devoted to smell. So this is approximately 400 different genes. Um, it's about 2% of our genome, so it's a huge amount of genetic information. Wow. It's like roughly the same amount of genetic information that separates humans from our closest primate uh, relatives. And is this because it's more important to smell the bear than to <laughs> taste the bear? <laughs> <laughs> well, usually with, um, with tastes, you have sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami, and then the sort of deep scientific research is trying to find more. Um, so Cheetos. Anything, it's che the Cheeto <laughs> sensor. Yeah, yeah Cheeto. Also, I, I'm with you. It's better to <laughs> smell the bear before you're close enough to taste it. Well, yes, yeah. that's yeah. the point. Yeah, I agree 100% well, so on that is, one. So the reason I bring up orthonasal olfaction and retronasal olfaction Again. is because smell plays two roles for us and for a lot of animals. So there is the um, sniffing in role, the orthonasal role, so that's smelling the bear before we get there. Um, and then once you, let's say, fight with the bear and conquer, really? conquer the bear and roast the bear. Um, <laughs> 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 if, you're, if you're eating the bear, and I think you know, what are you mean? doing in Denmark? <laughs> what, what's going on there? <laughs> Whatever happened? That's in how you get oh. the job. You have to conquer a bear. <laughs> Should we um. see the bear, understand the bear, and run away from the bear? Is that step one? <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's straight from smelling to killing and roasting. Yes. All right, wait, wait, but, so there we go. But, 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 but then when, when you have food in your mouth, you're also experiencing smell. So it has this dual role of sniffing things out in the environment, but also giving you this rich sensory experience while you're eating. While, now, could, given all that you know about receptors, the shapes of molecules as they enter our head, mm -hmm. can you imagine either you or a future AI inventing a whole new smell or a whole new flavor? Is that a possible future uh, goal of what you do? Well, interestingly, so the, the human sense of smell is very flexible. So we have about 400 different receptors, but we can smell thousands upon thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of different odor molecules. So through what we call combinatorial coding, nice. um, <laughs> Uh, you're able to kind of, rather than um, just picking out one particular molecule, you get like a pattern for each type of molecule. So actually, like quite frequently, the flavor industry will synthesize a new molecule that has never existed in nature before, oh. but we are able to smell it. Okay. So, so you can have a new smell that's a combination of other smells that doesn't exist itself. Yeah, or the, uh, the, the pattern that it makes in the brain um, actually activates different like memory associations. Yeah. So if if like, you know, this this part hanging off the molecule kind of reminds me of lavender and this part of the molecule, this is your brain talking, kinda activates the like leather memory. Oh um, my god, it's my grandmother. <laughs> 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 That's what it smells like. It smells like grandmother. <laughs> Wait, so Alton, uh, in principle, you don't have to be in her lab to come up with some truly innovative new flavor. You you're you're the guy you're, you're like, you, you are food geek in the food universe. But, it, but I'm not inventing new flavors. I mean, she's talking about actually inventing something that doesn't exist that you wouldn't be able to, All right, well, I'll, only I'll, your I'll, limbic system I'll, would be able to figure that out. You combine other flavors in ways no one had previously dreamt of into a new culinary masterpiece. Does he, has he met me? <laughs> <laughs> What I try to do is to make something taste more like what you think it ought to taste like. So everybody knows in their head what mac and cheese ought to be like. Oh, yeah. Right? But when you make your own mac and cheese, it very often does not reflect that sense. So what I try to do is to, to, to make food taste more like the thing you thought it ought to taste like. And sometimes that involves adding things that you didn't know would go in there. So very often that's, that is waking up one flavor by supporting it with another. So I might go into macaroni and cheese and I might put a little bit of nutmeg in there uh, because I know how that supports certain cheese aromas. Um, and I do know that as That's food why they coming up, put that in lasagna. Yes. They'll put a, just well, they a do. little. In bachamel sauce, because bachamel is one of the binders. That, but see, as food, and, and this is something Aaron Allen talked Wait, about. You said bachamel sauce. 
Well, the is that what I would have been making? I didn't know that. Well, in That's lasagna, the there's often a white sauce that is what the French would call bechamel. But I, I, why are the French making lasagna? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't. I, 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 <laughs> I, I didn't mean to blow a gas. Because when it comes to cooking, the French do whatever they want to do. <laughs> <laughs> they invent all of it. <laughs> but the point is, is when you, when you go to eat, very often the aroma gets to your nose long before the food gets. So we eat with our eyes, then we eat with our nose, and then it finally actually gets into our mouth. Well, there's a lot of things that we can do with, with herbs and spices. They're actually a lot more about making that, that connection first. Because then you're like oh my God, I'm home, you know? Or, oh my gosh, I'm loved, because some of us grew up associating love with noodles. That's okay, but that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but sometimes it's, it's, it's turning around and saying, and, and this is something that, because I've read a lot of Ariel's work, is that you, you, you all of a sudden realize, okay, this, this compound in this food would actually taste more like itself if we put this in it. But yet, this is not something that you would normally associate. You wouldn't think of. Okay, for instance, I can make chicken soup taste hella more like chicken by using miso paste in it. Not enough so that you would recognize that it's there, okay? And there are a lot of ways to play that game in, in the food world. Back mm -hmm. me up on so, that. So, yeah. so this is you experimenting <laughs> in the kitchen. Absolutely. But, I, but how do you tap Ariel's expertise okay. when you're in the kitchen and you're left alone in the kitchen. How do you grab... Well, the number one way that I tap her knowledge is when a, s a word has more than five syllables. <laughs> <laughs> I call up Ariel and I say, what the hell is that? <laughs> and then she answers with a bunch of other five-syllable words that I still can't understand. Because you have a lookup chart. Which we still have. You just have a lookup chart. You, yeah. um, but, but, but a lot of time, it's, it's coming to... When, when I read um, really great chemistry, some of it's just understanding how things work. But, but some of it is then understanding how we can take our knowledge. And especially now in a culture, we have more foodstuffs available to us than any culture ever in the history of mankind. True? Yes. Yeah, more than kings and queens of... I don't f***ing know. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I guess. Look, 10 years ago on TV, there were a whole bunch of things I couldn't do that I can do now because you can simply order things by going like this. Okay, so, you know, 10 years ago, we weren't using Aleppo pepper in dishes for home cooks because they couldn't get it, right? Today, we go like this. As we have more and more stuff available to us, we've got to figure out, well, how do we, how do we use this to still make food that we want to eat? Now, she works with people that are actually inventing new foods and new flavors. I just want to make the macaroni and cheese better. All right, but often when we think of sort of food experiments, any normal person would wonder whether you guys in the kitchen are going to somehow take our palate to the limit. So I just want to know, is there some limit beyond which you would not try? Some combination of ingredients, short of it being actual poison. I'm just wondering, is there, or, or is anything well, poison, fair game? Po poison's a funny thing because... No, our, it's not a funny thing. Well, not very no. funny. No, I'm backing is. up Dale on this because one, it's not very funny, it's not. We, we, we have very strong taste receptors for astringency, do we not? And bitterness. Uh, and bitterness, greatly because it keeps us from eating poison. And yet, we teach ourselves to drink things like coffee and scotch, which ought to be poison, but they're not. So some of it's training, some of it's uh, acclimation, uh, cultural acclimation. Wait, 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 wait. If that flavor is associated with things that will kill you, yes. then it's just kind of by accident that you're still alive if you like this flavor of bitter. You just... Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> I mean, at some point, somebody had to eat that first oyster, or somebody had to uh, sniff that first Band-Aid. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a dangerous world out there. And Somebody had to pluck that chicory from the field and be like, I need a And I need chicory a is a perfect, or, or, yeah. or the first uh, rhubarb, exactly. where they figured out, oh, the last five people who ate this died. <laughs> I'm going to cook it. <laughs> All right, so, so I, I bet Jordan's with me on this. If the last four people died, I'm not cooking it. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm like you know what? We don't need to eat rhubarb anymore. <laughs> At all. <laughs> what's this, what's this mac and cheese thing you're talking about? Yeah, not even in a pie. Yeah. But, but we don't, humans don't do that. We do not do that. Dead we humans. We keep going back. Dead no, humans. No, we're do that. so curious. We see that stack of bodies and we're like, no, I can do it. <laughs> 
You're the, 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 the true innovator. <laughs> Eat that ant. Somebody. <laughs> right? What you need is a bunch of archaic frat boys around daring each other to eat things. And so one of them will figure out. <laughs> that Mu didn't kill us. <laughs> mushrooms would be the perfect example. Yeah. Try this mushroom, One tasted bro. good. The other made you trip. The other dissolved your liver into a puddle. Yeah. <laughs> You learn real quick, you know? Is this why people go to this restaurant you work at? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're just a pile of bodies outside and being like, this is a good restaurant, you gotta try it. Well, we... <laughs> no reservation. <laughs> <laughs> just dragging the people out. I just... We would... We would... <laughs> Don't have the face. Don't we would, try we the would rhubarb. Never, we would never pick things like mushrooms that we had, like, not a really good you know, uh, botanical and ethnobotanical idea of what was safe. And we would also never feed anything to a customer that we hadn't eaten ourselves first. Good policy, um, sure. So, yeah, you know, so if everybody were, in the kitchen is dead, <laughs> shake <laughs> there, were, there were episodes of, um, you know, one of one of my colleagues trying out a new mushroom and uh, you know having to run to puke in the dumpster before he had to go into service, and then we never served that mushroom. Um, but <laughs> Was there no, that's no human has ever no, wait, wait, no human Ariel, customer has ever gotten. Ariel, it. What, are you saying <laughs> that? Your own staff and then the occasional customer no, no are customer. the experimental no playground of your culinary <laughs> no. exploits? Welcome to Flavorama, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Should we call you so, Dr. Flavor? Oh, uh, yeah. You can if yeah. you want. Evil <laughs> Dr. Flavor. Yeah. Evil. Evil Dr. Evil Flavor. Do evil. Dr. Evil Flavor. <laughs> Do you have a server who comes over and then a priest comes over after the meal? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, in, in all seriousness, for, for any of the, like, quote-unquote novel things that are happening at these restaurants, you're usually, you're trying out new things, but you're drawing on either validated scientific research or, like, long histories of, of safe techniques. So, like, for some ingredients, there are no, no safe way to eat them, or it's, you can eat them, but only once. Uh, and, for, <laughs> and for some things, there's there's things that's that called we, poison. We yeah. have a word for that. Yes. <laughs> there's techniques that we know we have to have to use for them. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, there's a, a lot of uh, safety and concern over safety. I have one note. Place. I have a note about <laughs> before, mushrooms. Before any that them. I, I think most people don't know that the common ancestor between animals and mushrooms separated in the tree of life later than that common ancestor and that which produced green plants mm -hmm. separated. So that humans and mushrooms are more genetically alike than either humans or mushrooms are to green plants. So that last pizza you ate, you're an incestuous bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I think the word you're looking for is cannibalistic. Yeah. Yeah. Cannibal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 Have I not been having sex this whole time? <laughs> Is that how you do it? We've been talking about sex this whole time, right? Wait, what's happening here? <laughs> It's just, it's just an arrow because we only have you for a few more minutes. Because we, we, we're going to swap you out with yet another person on stage here. <laughs> Much like your restaurant. Um, I, a couple of things. Are there any obvious challenges that you see in this moment for the future of cooking? I want to ask both of you that. Um, there's a something, if we only had this, of, or if we could oh, only okay. do that, just some, something that is on the horizon that's in the lab that's going to show up soon, what might that be? Well, I would say if we only had governments that understood that global warming's happening, and if we don't do something, <laughs> or <laughs> <f> <laughs> yeah. Alton, that's in our third segment today. <laughs> Sorry, I... <laughs> You provided the segue. I'm you get doc to turn. <laughs> Ariel. Some of, some of the stuff that I'm most excited about at the intersection of food and science right now has to do with um, plant breeding and seed breeding. So for a very long time, um, plants have been, especially in the U.S., bred for uniformity, for yield, and for shippability. So um, if you hear your grandmother saying, like, oh, the tomatoes don't taste like when I was a little girl, like, that's because they don't. They have lost flavor in the process. Um, Turns out it's actually very simple to, to breed plants for flavor, just not a lot of people are doing it. So there's some very cool projects, um, especially out on the West Coast, University of Oregon, University of Washington, the Bread Lab uh, is one of them, um, where they are growing vegetables and grains and uh, things like wheat and barley to be extremely flavorful and cook very well. Um, so 
that I think is one of the most exciting combinations of uh, food and science to be hitting the grocery stores sometime soon. But will it be shippable and will it be <laughs> packageable? Because that's how we got to flavorless tomatoes to sure. begin with, right? But if and you uniformity and beautiful and. But if you can breed tomatoes to grow well in specific regions or. Yeah, then you don't example, have to ship them. Then you don't have to ship them. Duh. If you grow. Uh, there's, there's did I get a you on that one? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Face palm on that one. <laughs> <laughs> there's a um, there's a I barley project at, in Oregon called uh, the Multi Barley Project, and this is a very biodiverse strain of barley. You can grow it in many places, and each place will express a different sort of phenotype and flavor. So, so terroir, you get a different uh, terroir. Get, get well. Very nice, terroir. Yeah. the terroir. Very wine word there, <laughs> terroir. <laughs> terroir. <laughs> yeah, terroir. Well, we're going to end this segment, and we're going to get ready for the next segment, which is going to be all about food in space. When Stark Talk continues. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> Dr. Ariel, thank you for oh, coming. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Star Talk segment two. Welcome back, Town Hall. We are live from Town Hall in New York City. I'm with my comedic co host, Jordan Klepper. Hey, everybody. Special guest, Alton Brown. And in this segment, we're going to talk about food in space. I need an expert on that, and we got her. Now joining us is NASA food scientist, Dr. Grace Douglas. Grace, come on out. Grace, thank you. Grace is the lead scientist in NASA's advanced food technology research effort. Thanks for coming up from Houston. Yes. To be in New York for this. Absolutely. I'm, glad I'm a little you. afraid to ask you what you're holding in your arms there. <laughs> Some snacks for you. Snacks. <laughs> they look nasty. <laughs> nasty. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those a little later. So tell us, what is the Advanced Technology Food Project at NASA? So basically, we have a food system that works on the International Space Station, but we know that there are shortfalls and we need to get to um, long duration space exploration missions. And so in advanced food technology, we uh, do research on foods. We do research on how to fit in the very, very small resources that are provided on missions. And we also do research on how we're actually promoting crew health and performance. So making sure that the food can actually do that. So, uh, I, so I'm curious about something. When we think of NASA, we think of rockets and things. Hardly ever do we think that there are people in NASA trying to keep the astronauts alive. And so you're in that division, right? And of course, the, the, the astronaut program is based in Houston. So it would make sense that the food research is there as well. Yes. So, so you've got um, the, so specifically, you focus on how food tastes or just whether it goes bad or not? We have to focus on every part of it, which the, mo the key po components of it are the uh, safety, nutrition, and flavor. Because food for the International Space Station actually needs an 18-year shelf life at a minimum. And it's better if it's longer. 18 Ooh. years? 18 months. Months. 18 months. Okay. 18 months. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That's still a long amount of time. <laughs> <It's still laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> oh, that's my Oh. OK. Yes. And this turkey sandwich will last. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I thought he said 18 years. That's an 18 month turkey sandwich? Fine. <laughs> uh, That's true, Jordan. Both of those don't sound good. They don't right. sound uh, super tasty. Okay. Wait, wait. So, what is non safe food? Well, that would be food. So, we process our foods to make them safe. We have freeze dried foods, so microorganisms can't grow in there. And um, we have retort foods thermostabilized foods, which is basically canned foods, except we use a pouch. So that's the silver pouched item. And that one. Nope. The other. <laughs> this one. Yes. So 
This is uh, basically, it's similar to what the military uses, but it's lightweight, so we can get it up into space. Uh, mass and volume are huge considerations for space flight. So we the pouch is lightweight. Those. Yes, the pouch is lightweight. This is a canned food in a pouch, basically. And so we have to process, this is processed to commercial sterility, just like canned foods in the grocery store. Mm, so yummy, sterility. <laughs> so we don't. So microorganisms are your enemy. For safe food, yes, over time when you have to store it for that amount of time and we have no refrigerators and no freezers and the possibility that we still won't have those going on a Mars mission where the shelf life will need to be five years at that point. That, that's enough for a return trip. Yes. Right, right. So, so what, what, you, didn't, you haven't yet mm -hmm. talked about flavor. Yes. Just whether the thing, whether so it's bad for there's you. There's three points. The first is safety, the second is nutrition, and the third is acceptability. And that's in total. <laughs> <laughs> so how about potato chips? <laughs> <laughs> well, so potato chips are interesting. You can send them, but they often have a lot of crumbs. And so They're crunchy. That causes a problem in microgravity. Um, so Okay, so safety has two meanings then. Yes, it does. That's that's very true. Will it kill you because you it it I don't know, it floats into your nose or something. Or or whether it's whether there's some microorganism that'll give you a, a stomach virus or something or whatever. So a lot of foods like potato chips are shelf stable, so they will last. They will tend to go rancid over time. You'll get some off flavors. They won't taste as good, and the food definitely needs to taste good. If it doesn't taste good enough, uh, the crew doesn't want to eat enough of it or choose those foods, and then they can lose weight. They can lose bone mass and muscle mass, and so we really have to provide food that they choose to eat, that they want to eat, and so they're uh, there's a common assumption that high-performing individuals like astronauts will eat whatever you tell them to eat just to get the mission accomplished. Basically, we could give them vitamin pills, we could give them um, protein shakes, they'll get it done, which actually those things are not that healthy. But they will, um, they're, they're, they're actually just like us on Earth, and they really want good food, nutritious food, and food becomes very important in isolation and confinement. It's we I hear that astronauts might lose their sense of taste in zero G or in space. Is that true? And what, what, what is meant by that? So some astronauts come back and say the food tasted different or they didn't taste it as much as they would on Earth. And so they I mean think the intensity of maybe flavor. something's going on right. But there are other astronauts who come back and say they didn't notice a difference. And there's several things that could possibly be impacting that. So there, there's a fluid shift towards their head when they're in microgravity. And so that can give them the sensation like when you have a cold, so you wouldn't taste things as well. Also, um, everything they're eating is out of a package and they're not cooking, it's just heating out of water. So they're getting packaged foods in and out without cooking and then the aroma doesn't rise in microgravity, it just dissipates. And there's also a lot of competing aromas on the International Space Station if you ever live in an enclosed environment with five other people. So... <laughs> the so Russians. You said the word aroma, but you really mean stank. You said aroma, but you mean like B.O. There can Smelly be, out there, there. There can be bad smells over time if you're in an enclosed environment with a lot of other people. <laughs> Really? Is, is there any kind of a is there any kind of a food space race? Like, are the Russians developing flavors that are more intense than American flavors? Is there a competition in that? How are we doing? Are we going to win? <laughs> <laughs> Who's I got jambalaya? Is that on our side? <laughs> I would think that the Chinese would actually have this because of their uh, because of their their spice range and because of the use of things like Sichuan peppercorns and whatnot. They would they, those would be very opening of the head kind of uh, kind of flavors. Russians. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, vodka, so, though, vodka. So, Grace, would you one day call up Alton and say, "Help me out here because my astronauts are about to mutiny"? <laughs> well, they did. It, they, uh, Emeril Lagasse, bam, uh, sent food up to. Was that a, that was the space station, right? Yeah, he yeah. He, he helped work on a few formulations. Um, so, just to be clear, when he says "bam," isn't he always putting garlic into his food? No, <laughs> no. It's anything he wanted. Bam. Bam. Okay. Just checking. You guys remember BAM, right? <laughs> <laughs> BAM, formulation. <laughs> the problem is in space, like, BAM, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> how, how did that, that, I hear the jambalaya went over well. Uh, so actually, I think we might have a, I, I don't know if I brought that one out, but I think it's out there, the spicy green beans. It's in the white package <laughs> over there. 
This? Yeah. This is the tomatoes that was actually and artichoke. One of those that he helped. This is spicy out. green beans. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. No, I'm not going to eat. No. Yes. No. Neil yeah. should eat that right now. No. <laughs> yeah. Right now. Let, let's just be clear. Uh, let's just be clear. Grace, you brought these because these foods are expired <laughs> uh, from your shelf. Says right here, good till 5,027. <laughs> <laughs> so, so More than how, 18 months. So, how important is variety? Variety is actually. Don't answer that until he eats those green beans. <laughs> look at that. Look at that move well, on. <laughs> they're actually freeze dried, so I don't know how easy it would be to eat those. What, uh, these here? <laughs> <laughs> So, this, this, uh, <laughs> tomato and artichoke, I recognize it from here. You read the packet. I did, but, yes. but, so, it's in Russian. So, what kind of variety <laughs> mm -hmm. is, is offered? Because I think a lot about, suppose I only could eat one food on a Mars mission, what food would that be? I'll tell you what that food is in a minute, but. After you eat the cream. No, no. <laughs> so. So, green so, beans, <laughs> green beans. <laughs> so, so tell me about variety. You are not going to do it, are you? <laughs> you are not going to do it. <laughs> Come on, Neil. They want you to eat them. Fine. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Yeah. Fine. This is, look at this. All right. Help, help. Wait, there's help. another packet Wait, inside the packet. <laughs> Oh, none for me. Damn. <laughs> okay, how do I put can, water in there? Actually, can we you force? You need a needle to put water in there. I don't have a needle. <laughs> Where's your kit, man? Oh! What if my chef friends? They should have one. <laughs> what, what, what if I found something to cut the end off? Could we just, you know? I probably could. I'll go find some scissors. That's going to be okay. You're going to get your beans. Don't worry. It's... So was this in a in a opaque packet to prevent light from getting in? Because clearly it's shrink wrapped or freeze dried shrink wrapped. So now air is not going to get in. That reduces oxygen. But does, is light also damaging to this? For certain vitamins, light can be damaging oxygen and moisture, and that package does not protect from those things. So we do add the aluminum foil layer to so, get a longer so, shelf you know, life. I forget nutrients, of course. Yes. So, uh, vitamins are not all stable under right. all situations. Right. Especially vitamin C. It's very, very unstable, and that's why scurvy was so prevalent in the history of exploration before spaceflight. <laughs> How's scurvy doing up there on the International Space Station right now? <laughs> we, we've got that thing covered, right? For the International Space Station, yes. Not yet for Mars, though. <laughs> Are you dealing with, are you getting a lot of feedback from astronauts? I got to imagine astronauts aren't the easiest people to work with as far as taste testers go. Is that, is that in and of itself hazardous? Don't, don't, pay, pay no attention to that. That, that man struggling to open a package over there. <laughs> is this, this is recent. What? So. Technically, this is what we call on Earth a corkscrew, but here. I don't want you to I need seat. you to all open right, my okay, phone. all right. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Should he pour some so water So it takes in there? like 10 minutes to rehydrate with hot water. So. Well, no, I think it takes an hour to rehydrate. <laughs> no, it's going to be fine. That's in hot water. And we, uh, all right, here we go. Wait, wait, here. Actually, it doesn't smell too bad. Wait, 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 Jordan, smell this. This is. Uh, it doesn't this smell too bad. There's, a, no, there's, there's like bad. a nice curry smell. Yes. To it? Yes. It smells like a like a like a like a a Thai uh, coconut soup. Okay, that's enough. I'm a professional. I know when it's enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll let this Ten hydrate. Minutes? How much in cold water? You we'll let this hydrate. We'll let, okay. Yeah, we'll let that hydrate for a minute, oh. but we're All not right. going to forget. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so if I'm a typical astronaut in the American sector of the space station, how many options am I going to have for dinner? Well, we have about 200 different foods and beverages on our standard menu, and then they can supplement that on the International Space Station with some preference foods. 
that we send specially for each crew. And that sounds like a lot, perhaps, but if you were to talk to the people next to you and ask them what they ate for lunch, it's probably very different than what you ate. There's a lot of variety here on Earth. We take that for granted. And it's also important for crew to get variety. They say they really love getting choice in their food system that helps keep them eating enough so that they don't lose weight, they don't lose body mass and muscle mass and um, bone mass. So those things are very, very important to have the variety. And, and honestly, as we go towards Mars, it's going to be much more difficult to provide that, both because we don't have a current food system with that shelf life, although we are working on those challenges, and because um, we might even pre-position food ahead of a crew, which makes it very hard. Uh, on, to a, on a supply food. chip. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. So, I mean, Mars is really far away. I mean, you can explain probably why why we can't send resupply once we go to Mars. Yeah, because you're not in phase with the position of the planets in orbit. So you're better off sending food up first. Yes, in another phasing of where Mars and Earth are in their orbit with respect to each other. Then how long would you have to wait between sending food up and sending a crew Right, up? so every 26 months, Mars and Earth are aligned so that you can go there in nine months. But once you get there, you have to wait again until they realign in order to send another supply. So what you could do is send a supply before it or after it um, so that they don't have to try to make food while they're there. But yeah, there's a time delay for that to happen. Do you mean grow potatoes in poop, Neil? That's, <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> um, is, there, is there one food, uh, Alton, is there one food that is perfectly nutritious so that if you ate it, you wouldn't have to eat any other kind of food? Why wouldn't that be that new product, Soylent? How about that? Well, <laughs> it might be. It might be Soylent. Any food that's designed, and I'm sure that you guys have tested just about everything. By the way, are M&Ms really like cigarettes in prison on the <laughs> space station? Because I read that M&Ms are like, where do the M&Ms, man? I want my M&Ms because they uh, float around and you go, ah, man, it's On a the great, space station? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not lying, am I? I M&M's on this. ISS M &M's. are the same as cigarettes in prison. Yes, or coffee, because <laughs> they don't let you have c cigarettes in prison anymore. It's true, though, isn't it? Well, they actually get coffee that they want on the International Space Station. They can have it with milk and sugar or, well... Kona I, coffee with yeah. cream and sugar. Whoa. That's good. So is there, so other than uh, Soylent, so is, is there you know one? There is one. I, for instance, if, if you were to tell me, you got to go right now and you can only have one food to live on, I would probably say quinoa. I ain't going into space. Can <laughs> no, I know the perfect food. I, I, I don't know why it? I asked you. What is I know it? the perfect food. What is it? New York pizza. <laughs> you give me, I, I've thought this through. If you put me on a mission to Mars and I had only one food, it would be New York pizza and like a. a That's a, one. That, wait, hang on. And a strawberry milkshake. That's two. <laughs> yes, I, would, I, would, I could eat that every day for five years. And in about a month, how do you think you'd feel? <laughs> <laughs> you'd be like, hey, hey, hey. So, <laughs> <laughs> this hat sure did get a little. Wait, wait, wait. So, well, I don't care what you say because I it's got space. astronauts. Nobody can hear you. <laughs> First, oh. I'm in New York City right now. <laughs> Second, I have. Proof that pizza's the best thing. Yes, I have, let's go to the videotape. Here we go. From the ISS. So I don't mean to brag, but no, that, you got it, man. I got you on that yeah, one. I got, got, you, got, you, got you on that one. So, so uh, let me ask another kind of question. There's food as nutrition, but sometimes you want space to feel like home. If you might be homesick, yeah. especially on a 
long mission, and you're not just far away from home, you're far away from your planet as it recedes in space. Alton, you, you, don't you specialize in like homey tastes? Uh, not only that, I, I, I think that, and, and you can obviously speak to, to those, those flavors, I think there's actually something to be said for the actual cooking process itself as well. Oh, the ritual. But the actual ritual. That, that, they ritualized the pizza here. That was a whole family was, affair. Let's face it, that was like the most Instagrammable of all moments, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I had zero gravity, I could do pizza too. Um, <laughs> but sure, there are flavors of home. There, there are th and I'm sure that you guys spend a lot of time trying to hit on what is going to make people feel like they're still connected without making them blubber like crybabies that mommy's gone. I mean, because there's, there's homesickness is a weird thing. And it's got, you know, there's so much different emotions tied up in food. And as people get further, further away, say going to Mars, at, at what point does the power of, 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 of what food can do to people's emotional mindsets become something that we've never even thought about? You guys have got to be studying that. And what, and what, how do you even go about studying that? Sorry, I had to ask. But yeah, you, on, you want to roll it. I, I want to know. I, I, I just, shut up. Yeah. I'm just really curious because I know here on this planet, even though I asked you that question, well, you can I, pass it on to her. <laughs> That's fine. Because she's going to have the answer that, Go. that I want, at least. How do, you, how do you figure that out? Well, that's actually a very complicated question um, because, like you just mentioned, you like pizza. Everyone wants something different, and there is no perfect food, so you have to eat a wide variety just to get all your nutrients, and we have to be able to provide choice so that people can get all those nutrients. Like fruits and vegetables actually have thousands of phytochemicals. We don't even know what they all are and how they're interacting with our bodies, with our microbiomes, with our gut-brain axis and impacting how we think and how we feel. And all of those things are happening just from what we But just to be clear, what you just referenced there in those few sentences, isn't that like newly emergent understanding of the role of the microbiome within our body? Yes. We think we just eat food and it comes out, but there's like countless microorganisms doing our bidding for us in our digestive tract. What? <laughs> you make it sound like Game of Thrones is going on inside. <laughs> I'm doing my bidding. <laughs> Take a knee. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, at, but th to the point of the question, there's all of this going on, but there's certain foods, certain rituals that we associate with home right. that could serve our psychological state um, mightily. So how much thinking do you guys do about this? So w we think about that whenever we're developing new foods, but the goal really is to provide a variety because we have to be able to meet the needs of many different people and their captive audience. So once they go into space flight, we can't send anything else. So it's not like going to the grocery store and you can pick what you want that day. So they have to be able to find stuff that's there that they want to eat every day, which is its own challenge and food that does give them comfort and we have a lot of crew come back and tell us that food became so important in space flight, they didn't realize how important it was going to become. And what about the ritual part, as, yeah. as, as, Not only as, as Alton together. describes? Because, I mean, almost any movie, the most tense, intricate, or personal part is when everyone is around a table yes. eating food. And like an alien. <laughs> I wasn't really thinking about that, but sure. Okay. So. So the, the dinner table, you know, we, we mock what happens at Thanksgiving when weird uncles come by and aunts with different political views than you have. Um, so we, we mock that, but in fact, the food is what got everyone together. It, it, it didn't even matter that it's a holiday called Thanksgiving. It's a holiday where food is front and center. And as, as Alton has, has persistently described, this, this is a... This is a taproot ritual that we have as a species. So in space, are there ways that these other rituals fold into just even the preparation and eating of food? Well, we do provide time for them to eat together. And so usually a lot of crews try, they get to do this at their own discretion. So a lot of crews try to find time every day or at least every week to have a meal together for that very reason. And they find it built, it helps build cohesion. It does stimulate conversation, especially when you have international crews. And they can share international foods at that point too because um, the, the Russians have a Russian food system and the US side has a US food system. And then when we have a uh, crew from Europe or Canada, um, 
or JAXA, the Japanese space agency, they will bring some of their own foods. And so there's a lot of camaraderie around that. And that is incredibly important and something that we definitely have to consider as we go into exploration, how to stabilize those foods too, so that they can continue. And there's also water supply, because you can't, unless you lasso a comet, the water you bring has to be recycled. Most of the water on ISS is recycled. So should we ask further about that or just let, leave it right at that? <laughs> should we just, Jordan, should we? I'd like to know a little bit. <laughs> I mean, the first thing, yeah, the first thing you have to get off the table is do you drink your own pee? <clears throat> then it's like, are you guys eating together? What do you cook? Like, <laughs> right there. And like, every first question about a space station is like, urine, you drinking it? Okay. Well, now how are you doing? How's your family? Uh, your, pee, your pee is not the only body fluid where you can recover water, just Ooh. to be clear. Mm -hmm. Oh. I'm just, well, there's your sweat, there, right? There's, yeah. Yeah, and, you, and, and the fact that you can exhale onto a mirror and it will fog the mirror means there's moisture coming out of your breath. You're, you're dodging the, are these people drinking their pee question. <laughs> so, no, so. You're totally drinking the pee. <laughs> totally drinking the pee. So, for Star Talk, just recently, I interviewed two International Space Station astronauts while, while they were on board. And you may recognize their names, Jessica Meir and Christina Cook. They, they made headlines for being the first team, female team, to spacewalk together. And we chatted about food in space. Let's check it out. For long-term space travel, obviously there'll be some expectation that you grow your own food. And is there, how close are we to growing all of your own food without requiring sort of supply chains, either to and from the space station or to and from Mars, if that's our ultimate destination? Absolutely, great question. I think that right now we're at a place where we're learning the best you know, ways that we can grow things in space, but where we're really looking to go is to develop systems that are, one, closed loop systems. So a system where we're using waste products from various sources and feeding those in to the um, actual plant development. And that can include our carbon dioxide cycle, our oxygen cycle, and our water cycle. And we actually have some really neat life support systems on board right now that are testing some of those technologies. Another aspect of the food system that really has to grow would be incorporating proteins. Right now we have lettuce as our main you know, crop that we've grown. We've grown different things up here. They're, they've grown flowers. We're looking into starting into vegetables and fruits. But incorporating protein sources like peanuts or maybe legumes I think is the next sort of big leap. We're not quite there yet. Um, as Jessica men mentioned, we've had salad, and we joke sometimes that the caloric uh, intake that, it's, that we've used so far in growing it might be a little bit more than what we end up consuming. But obviously, the techniques are what's important in proving out the systems and uh, the operational concept. I'm, I'm guessing that you're not going to anytime soon uh, start traveling with farm animals. So likely, all of your protein will come from plant-based sources which would mean the future of space exploration would be vegetarian. That's what that sounds like. Maybe. We're not sure. You know, we also do have some other devices that are pretty exciting up here right now. We have uh, one facility called the Biofabrication Facility, which is actually the goal of that is to, heart, to grow human organs in space. Now, that's, of course, not for food or consumption. That is to contribute to the deficit of organ for transplant operations on the ground. Um, by any kinds of efforts on the ground when you are trying to produce these tissues and make these bioartificial tissues, there are some problems with the support structure for these. And so the theory is that in microgravity, we won't have that problem with the support structure so we can better grow these bioartificial tissues and then turn them into complete organs. Going a little bit along with that with 3D printing, we have other 3D printers up here to make other pieces of hardware. The Russians also recently tested some animal cells, so some animal protein cells to see whether or not they could 3D print meat. So there are some experiments that are look trending in that direction as well. Okay, I, I, I don't know why I didn't think of that. Of course, if you can lab grow proteins, uh, meat proteins, then you never needed the animal in the first place, and then there's another source of protein for you. Well, excellent, guys. Thanks for taking the time for Star Talk Radio, and we got you on video as well. And so very much appreciated this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. It was our pleasure. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event as we count down to 20 continuous years of humans living and working on the International Space Station. I got to interject. When the movie Gravity came out, I posted a series of tweets. 
that commented on things they missed, like Sandra Bullock's bangs always pointed downwards. <laughs> and I said, am I being harsh? And I said, anytime you see anybody in zero G, the hair is going wild. And so I wanted to see wild bangs on Sandra Bullock, and we did not. <laughs> Everything else was zero G except her hair. I just wanted to <laughs> let the record show. Um, so, anyway, so, so Grace, uh, what are the capabilities? <laughs> get, 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 what's in your mouth? Spit that out. It was pretty good. Nearly. Yeah, I know. I said it smelled good. But I tasted it. <laughs> It's, it's good. It smelled good. It just smelled really bear. spicy. Eat the bear, Neil. It's really, it's really spicy, which you find that most people really do appreciate on station, right? It's, it's there pepper, are a lot of crew that like pepper, that. chili. It's not all crew, but a lot. Now, <laughs> if you're not, if you're not necessarily a proponent of the fluid in the head theory that everybody up there is like they've got a cold, what do you attribute yeah. this this um, desire for spicier food? Well, From a so standpoint. that also is just. I mean, not every crew looks for spicy food. Not everybody. And some of that might be because they're just eating prepackaged foods the entire time they're up there and they're not cooking and things like that. So that does provide differences in flavor. Condiments is one of the only ways that they have to customize their own foods. And so people are bringing up their own hot sauce bottle. They let you do that. Because it's not like a giant glob of sriracha floating through the, the cabin would be a problem. <laughs> well, they do Imagine get sriracha. Like, My eyes! You know, I mean that. <laughs> they do get sriracha. They do get sriracha, yeah. but do they get it in like a little bitty packet? They don't get like a bottle. Just don't touch they get your a fingertips bottle. to it. Yeah, they do. They, they get a can. bottle. They get an actual, yeah. how do you get it? How, do, how does that work? So, well, they send condiments and they have a little fridge up there now. But how do you dispense the, the sriracha? The, um... <laughs> Well, it has a certain surface tension, so that's how they eat yes. as well. So everything has a certain surface tension, and if you put it on your food and it has that surface tension, it stays. But it stays. Just like it'll stay on a spoon or a fork while you're eating it or in the package. Like pudding has very high surface tension. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Also, uh, do, do we need to call out why the yes, fact that I had <laughs> pudding. the Russians are 3D printing meat next door? <laughs> They, right. That was just an offhanded comment. Oh, yeah, and also right. the... So, Grace, what are the actual three. food capabilities on ISS right now? For daily food consumption, it's prepackaged food where they add water or they heat it. No, but uh, manufacturing, I'm talking and about. And then as far as... So that you saw that they grew some salad in the veggie, and that's it, as that's far as it. foods that they're actually eating. Will 3D printing be something that... I mean, because a lot of people think that's going to be an answer. So we've got an image of them harvesting mustard greens. Let's see if we have what we have up there. Why mustard greens don't look like that. Okay. Yeah, but if I'm in space, somehow I'm not thinking, gee, I, I hunger for mustard greens. No, you want pizza. No, no. Already <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me, if, as they said, growing the salad takes more energy than the energy it then provides to you, what hope is there that this would ever work? Well, they mentioned that this is proving out the systems at this point, and that's true. Because if we're ever going to become Earth independent and move towards those systems, you have to show that they work. And it is very challenging to water uh, crops in spaceflight. So we prove them out with the easiest systems, which are salad crops. And so next, they're planning on growing tomatoes in space. And so that requires artificial pollination. So there are a lot of things that you have to prove that you can do and actually get these things to You just bring swarms of bees into the <laughs> space station. What, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so I want both of your opinions about the future of lab-grown meat as a solution to the protein challenge in space. Are you cool with uh, Alton? Are you cool lab-grown lab -grown meat? I'm cool with it as a concept. I just don't know why we need it. I, I don't. I don't crave. I think that we, we've got to get to a point to where we're like, okay, well, we don't crave meat so much that we're willing to put this much energy into simply making an analog of it. Why not just make something delicious out of the things that we have that are renewable and that make sense? Um, and, you know, one of the issues now with, with meat analogs is that um, we're going to 80 people agreed with you on I know. that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the <laughs> other were, eight. But they uh, were the cool ones. Um, <laughs> One of, one of the issues I think we're going to get into with meat replacement is that it's all based on pea protein, essentially. There's a lot of pea protein involved. And, you know, that just means that we're shifting... No, no, that's meat substitute, not, not oh, lab-grown. You're talking about meat. absolutely lab-grown. Lab yeah, Sorry, yeah. I am talking about... I was growing talking meat, meat replacement. proteins. I don't... Growing organs for transplant is one thing. I don't know that we need to grow meat. I, I, I don't... I guess we've got to find Grace, out where, where if we've got to do it, but I don't know that I think it's necessary. Grace, where are you? 
I think that uh, looking at all of these options as you know, we have a growing population. We have a lot of challenges here on Earth. We have challenges in space flight with resources as well. Looking at options and seeing if they can become feasible is definitely worthwhile across the board because we have a lot. Looking at all options. Right, looking at all options. Um, there are still a lot of challenges with lab-grown meat that would need to be solved before that can become a viable option. Um, plus, you need to do the trade studies to see is this actually saving you anything? Because there's a lot of processing going into those things. Um, but looking at all the options is necessary because we have a growing population, because we have resource limitations on Earth, and that's very true in spaceflight too. Um, one of the challenges in spaceflight that's a little bit unique, um, especially with exploration missions where we only have a few crew, is that they would have to do the process themselves. So any process that we think could be a solution, it would have to be a solution from the beginning of producing it all the way to the point of consumption. Because if an astronaut has to actually participate in that process, I don't know, maybe some people like to go home and do a science experiment and then eat that science experiment after, <laughs> after they worked for a whole day, right? But um, in general, we like to look at things for exploration, especially as what are you willing to do in your own kitchen? And if some of these solutions can become resource viable, for exploration, meaning they use less resources than a prepackaged system, or perhaps you could find in situ re resource utilization on a planetary surface. Um, there's people. So in ISRU, b very big concept in NASA, right? Where you go there not bringing supplies with you, you go there look for the supplies that you would then use in situ. Right. While, while you're there, ISRU, yeah, very big concept in NASA. Sorry. So Continue. yes, and and you know there's groups that are looking at taking the, the um, uh, carbon dioxide and using the carbon in that as a source for so many other things. And if you start using that as a, as a feed source instead of having to take sugar or things like that, once we start overcoming these challenges, there's going to be new things that open up. But it is easier on Earth because those would be somebody's job and we go to the grocery store and we buy a finished product. For the crew, if they have to participate in that product, in that, um, in that production in any way, it has to be incredibly acceptable, something that we would want to do here on Earth. because Or you, so one of the important. astronauts' sole job would be to be the chef. <laughs> so, wait, so, Alton, if we... It's mushrooms again tonight, kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alton, it, there's got to be some interesting future in lab-grown meat proteins, because then you could molecularize it and put in one of your own unique sort of flavor Flavor. Sure. I, I'd be more interested, though, in coming up with various pastes that you could print, though. I mean, like krill or some other animal that has a huge bio payoff as far as its, its uh, it feed to, to body weight ratio, and then taking that and turning that into, like, okay, I'm going to take this cup of water, and I'm going to grow blah, blah, blah krill in it, sea monkeys, and then I'm going to grind them up in this machine, and I'm going to print a hamburger out of it. To me, it's like if we, if we can think of things that already grow, that are already, uh, you know, life forms that we know that we can take advantage of, that don't care that much about gravity, maybe they grow on water, whatever. There are bacteria that produce, for instance, uh, we talk a lot about umami as chefs. You know, there are bacteria that grow glutamates and glutamic acid can actually come off the bacteria. If all that could go into your little printer kit, you could just say, what do you want tonight? Well, I'll have that hot dog. And well, the recent that. research that shows that a very efficient, uh, um, even sustainable source of protein is rodents. Yes. So what's absolutely. The, what's the f New York City? <laughs> <laughs> We've got. So our rodents eat pizza, by the way. Just so you know. We've all seen the video, Neil. Yes, pizza rat. <laughs> um, so 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 great. Is there any talk at NASA about breeding rodents for protein for long-term missions? Well, actually, they can be a good source of vitamin C. <laughs> so no scurvy, yay. <laughs> I'll take so. the scurvy. <laughs> so is it happening? Well, no. Space rats? What, so what I would say about any sort of animals, um, it, you'd still be thinking of you have people. I'm not talking about any animals. I'm talking about rodents. But this is still true for rodents, so it would be true for anything. <laughs> as, as soon as you start having a group of explorers who are intended to go out and explore the Martian surface and then they come back, what are you willing to do in your own kitchen? And if you start having things like rodents, is that really something that we find acceptable 
Is it something they would find acceptable? Because we're trying to promote high performance. We want them to be at their top physical peak, at their top cognitive peak. So we want to give them foods that they really want to eat. Um, and then there's also an interesting um, thought that that could be the only other life form they're interacting with. And you know, there's oh. cases where if you become really attached to that I, life I saw form, that movie. It's called not gonna eat Willard. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you thought about maybe a mind experiment where like, okay, they're going to Mars. They're not going to want to eat rats, but they don't get any kind of outside information except for the stuff that we give them. So we create some sort of television shows where the reality back on Earth is where suddenly it's very cool to eat rats. And now everybody can eat rats. <laughs> and Jennifer Aniston <laughs> loves rats. <laughs> he eats rats. And over the time, they're traveling for months and months. And they're like, this seems to be the new cool thing. I don't know. Maybe this is something I could try. And then now they're eating the heads off rats and they're none the wiser. Has NASA thought Jordan, of that? Where did that come from? Jordan. You create, it's a propaganda machine. That's what a spaceship is. So after you're, you've gone out on the surface of Mars, you want to come back and have a big juicy steak is what you're saying. Or a really nice salad. No, nobody comes back from the surface of Mars <laughs> and wants a salad. <laughs> it's just not. Not even the vegetarians. No, no, they want, they want a steak too. <laughs> we got to end this segment. Coming up on the next segment, we're going to actually talk about the sustainability of food on Earth when Stark Talk continues at Town Hall Live! Welcome back to Star Talk Live from Town Hall, New York City. We're talking about food in space and on Earth. I've got Alton Brown in the house. Thank you. He's a patron saint of food geeks. We've... <laughs> <laughs> we also have Grace Douglas, Dr. Grace Douglas from NASA, Thank Houston. You. Jordan Klepper. So we talked about molecular gastronomy in space, and now let's talk about the future of food on Earth. So uh, both of you, I want to ask. By the way, I, when I look to NASA, I look at NASA solving problems we didn't even know needed solved, and then you learn that they actually have application back here on Earth. So when you look at the challenges, Alton, um, we have overpopulation. That's going to be a thing. It, if it's not a problem now, it will be soon. We've got climate change, restructuring where things are grown and where they're not grown. Are the honeybees? What, what's the, what's, I want an update on them. I, I don't know what. It ain't the, good. They ain't good. And overfishing. So it ain't good. all of these problems on Earth. So I want to ask you, where is this headed? And then, Grace, I want to know. Can you foresee any of the challenges of the Mars food problem actually having an application back here on Earth? So, Alton, where, where are we? Overpopulation. Are we going to be able to feed 10 billion, 20 billion people? Yes. Eat more people. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that movie. Uh, soil and green is obviously the answer, but I think it can be done with a more culinary uh, flair. Um, <laughs> OK. Um, we have to diversify our, our, our palates. We have to diversify um, our food supply system. One of the issues that we've run into in the United States is um, that we went to centralized uh, farming and, and centralized processing in this country after World War II. Um, and we, we, we transport things great distances instead of making things very locally. And, and the result of that is that we end up um, having all of a sudden maybe 70 people in six states get sick from something from lettuce, right? Which really shouldn't be happening. 
Um, but, that, but that's because we've got a food system that is based on giving everybody everything all the time. We're certainly giving people things out of season um, and things that require massive amounts of resources to grow, massive amounts of water, uh, massive amounts of land, certainly in the case uh, with, 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 with most cattle and other land-based animals. Uh, what we're going to have to face, the fact of, is that so far we have not managed things terribly well. Uh, we have not managed things terribly well. The oceans uh, certainly um, are our case in point. So I think what we're going to have to do, and this is going to be very difficult because it does require um, some international cooperation, is that we've got to re-examine the viability of what local farming looks like. And, and one of the ways that, that, that I feel hopeful about is, is the idea of vertical farming in the ocean, which is that we can take a, a, a patch of sea maybe a mile offshore of some place like Northern California, and that we can farm it from the surface all the way to the floor in a way that is sustainable, in a way that is also beneficial to the surrounding ecosystem. So we're talking about growing filter feeders uh, like, uh, like mussels that grow on ropes or oysters on the bed, growing a lot of kelp and, and also harvesting the animals that live inside that kelp in such a way that these kind of micro farms can create a lot of protein um, and a lot of nutrition while being uh, sustainably managed. Um, and that's a long answer, uh, but I do think that what it's going to take in, in the long run is we've got to vary what we eat um, and we, we've got to decentralize our, our food processing. Do you see any, uh, Grace, do you see any, anything lined up with what you're doing in Houston that could actually benefit any of this? I would say that a lot of the goals of NASA are similar to the goals in the world. We need to find things that are going to grow in very harsh environments um, and not even necessarily um, you know, that they're going to be outside, but the fact that you have to limit the water that you're using, that you have to find stuff that's going to be very resilient and crops that can just keep growing in those environments um, in very small confined spaces as well. So, um, you know, your idea of vertical farming and, and having some of the more sensitive crops even be grown in that sort of um, method so that you can really control it and produce more food and control where it's going um, is definitely... Uh, an advantage of those areas and definitely things that we'd have to look about it, look at if we're going to solve the world food problem. I think that there's a lot of other things um, that are out there that are being developed that might we might start seeing in the next couple years too, um, just in relation to things like um, the lab-grown meat and things like that. So we need to be exploring all of the options. Um, and for NASA, the real goal is how do we miniaturize that and how do we reduce the resources so to such a low level that we can actually put it on a space mission because it's very, one of the biggest challenges we always have with food, which weighs so much, is we have to reduce the mass and reduce the volume. So anything that we send to make food has to have reduced mass and reduced volume. The other thing is anything we send with food has to have a five-year shelf life if it's going to Mars. Any of the reagents that you're using with it, seeds would have to have a five-year shelf life in the radiation environment. So we have a storage um, concern there too, and that could be something that might also become more interesting on Earth um, as time goes on. So I think the idea that our resources are limited and we have to find those solutions, um, we tend to work with industry and with academia to find those solutions. Yeah, and that's just not an island in the middle right. of the country. Exactly. Yes. So, so Alton, are you, have you seen effects of the climate shift in what your tasks are in the kitchen, the availability of some foods relative to others, <coughs> or the cost? Absolutely. Um, a really great example um, of, of something that's going on right now that folks here might not even know about is that uh, sugar prices are about to uh, go um, up quite a bit. Uh, here in the United States, um, in this past year, last two years, the sugar beet crop failed in a good bit of the upper Midwest and Midwest due to weather conditions that have been attributed to global warming. Uh, this means that we are not going to be able to produce enough sugar and are going to have to now import it. But our governmental systems are set up specifically to place very high tariffs on foreign sugar because we wanted to keep our own sugar prices at a certain level. And now for and a lot of foreign time, crops. I mean, that's a lot it's of not crops. just the sugar. It's not. But the, the, the big thing right now, though, is coming into the holidays, major industrial bakers are getting uh, force majeure notices from the growers basically saying, yeah, sorry about that not having any sugar. Because they're, so now we're having to say, holy, holy moly, we've been self-supporting since, since the 30s in, in sugar, and now we, we cannot provide enough sugar um, for, for our industry. But there, there's a flip side of that. Like, for example, it's a little bit warmer in England now. And last I checked, they're growing wine. There's champagne coming out of England, and they're, like, boasting of it. Have you had any of it yet? No. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> 
My family's from Michigan, and they claim that Michigan will be wine country by 2070. <laughs> I'm hoping that's the well, case because I bought a significant amount of I mean, property. When you, start, <laughs> <Did> you? <laughs> when you start looking at, you know, it, 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 it major growing areas where something is very special, I mean, you, you know, you joke or we're joking about Champagne. Well, I mean, areas, sparkling wine, of course, because I mean, Champagne's only grown in Champagne. But I'm talking about that Champagne. When you're talking about those kinds of micro products, like in France, yes, very, very few degrees of change or Can a little totally bit of change in, in rainfall um, is going to completely knock that out. So I, I, I think that the you know, microclimate defined the product in the first place. It did the terroir, the microclimate, yeah. the hill that hit this side of the yeah. uh, sorry, the sun that hit this side of the hill that had this much chalk in it. So this much radiation was you know went back. Yeah, it's all about that micro terroir and those microclimates. Well, those are now changing, whether we want to admit it or not. They are. And so that is going to change the products that are available. So the best sham freaking pain in the world might be coming out of Detroit any minute. <laughs> Get so, your property now. It so, could happen. So I mean, it, it is not, it's not. Tell me about talking. the bees. Bees are in um, horrible shape. Bees in space actually really like that idea. Um, because, um, you know, bees are the major pollinator of uh, food crops in the United States and actually in most of the world. And due to some chemicals that um, we have used, on our crops, uh, the bee population is falling at an alarming rate. And when that drops to a particular level, it will simply be impossible to fertilize certain plants. You know, most, most of the crops in the United States are pollinated by bees. During that season, guys drive around, and girls, flatbed trucks full of beehives, park in the field, wait a few days, and then drive off. And those bees provide the pollination services. And so every flower that gets pollinated uh, some kind of fruit came out of that flower. Exactly. So th this that is the is whole That's the process. So any fruit. Or just the cross, yeah, the cross pollination of male to female plants, trees, it doesn't matter what it is. Right, yeah. right, right. And we're losing, we're losing colonies at a, at a horrible rate. And I, I hate to say that uh, there, there have been some, uh, some, some laws and legal shenanigans uh, even just this year that have perhaps made it harder to, to uh, protect them, which is so concerning. Could the future of molecular gastronomy find scientific chemical solutions to some of these problems that global climate change is bringing upon us? I will tell you that I know for a fact. To preserve some of what we I, cherish? I don't, know about, I don't know about that, but I do know that there is one uh, very, very, very um, highly respected technical university on the East Coast that is working on robot bees. I saw that episode of Dark Mirror. I'm telling Black you, Mirror. though, <laughs> so who, who robot, saw that episode? Bees, robot bees are actually happening. Uh, we will have micro-robotic pollinators for specific plants, and they will be sold to us by Monsanto. Just you watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but talking about those specific, you know, will I think that if, if cooks, whether it's molecular gastronomy or, or, or whatever, chefs as influencers, cooks as influencers, um, we, we do play a, a very significant role in this because we help figure out things for people to eat and then make them popular. And, and right now, in the last 20 years, that has really been the globalization of ingredients, uh, which has massively been the result of, of one thing, the internet, and specifically Amazon. And, uh, and which transportation. love it or hate it. Transportation. Yeah. Yes. Love it or hate it makes it possible for anybody to have anything any darn time they want. Mm -hmm. um, if I was doing a startup right now, it would be figuring out how to farm out of Amazon boxes. <laughs> All right. I'm going to turn Amazon boxes into a farm. Uh, there's right, got to so, be a way of doing that. So if farming, as we know, uh, large animal farming is hugely consumptive of water and it's land bad. and resources it's bad. and the like. So. There's the stuff that tastes like meat but is vegetable-based. What, what's it called? Um, well, there's Impossible Burger and Impo Beyond yeah. Beef, uh, Beyond Meat. Uh, like Beyond Meat, that. right. So uh, has NASA considered Beyond Meat as a, just for, to, to keep the flavor spectrum broad for those in space? So our foods right now, actually, we do send quite a few meats. So we can send real meats prepackaged, and they do last for several years to the crew. So right now, that would probably not be a solution because you'd just be replacing the meat with that burger for a few people. Um, and in general, most people in this country even are still um, omnivores. So there are very, it's a small percentage of the population that's vegan and vegetarian. So we support what the crews generally want to eat so that we can you know, keep them eating. However, um, you know, as you as you go forward in this area and get to a point where 
we're having colonization and people have specialized jobs and now you are growing crops, potentially that would be a solution there where that somebody's job is to make um, that, that sort of burger that way. So it, it, it could potentially happen. Um, we don't really know what the future of space food's going to look like, so it's wide open and it's really what, what can the solution be and can you get the resources down to enable that solution. There's actually a lot of resources that go into making those burgers. Alton, did you visit so one awesome. of those did you visit one of those plants? I have, yes. And what was your reaction? Wow, that's a lot of pea protein. That's a lot of pea protein. That was your reaction. I mean, that, that, okay. is, that is most of what is going in there. But it's got a longer um, shelf life than meat. Well, not if it's in one of these, right? I mean, meat can be several years. It doesn't matter uh, for, okay. for for a package like this. And if it's radiated so that you kill all the bacteria, or just um, thermostabilized, like canned food. Do you get to meet the pea protein? Do you get to pet the pea protein? I named. Uh, the oh, you well. named. Yeah. Pea protein. <laughs> um, but if, if if you guys knew that, for instance, okay, we can make a burger out of mushrooms. And we can grow mushrooms in space because mushrooms like it dark, they like it moist, they like, you know, then knowing how to do that would be, would be a benefit, right? Because you can extract protein from them. It's a lot easier than raising a cow in space. Um, or why are you yeah. smiling at me like that? That would be certainly true. <laughs> no, it's like, are you guys doing that? I mean, she's looking like. <laughs> Out, <laughs> anything would be easier than raising a cow in space is my guess. I'm just, that's. I'm just spitballing here. I, I think raising a wolverine? I, Could you raise I think a wolverine? Pigs in, space, <laughs> pigs in space would be very, very difficult. Teenager, um, yeah. But, but mushrooms and, and other things that have a considerable amount of uh, glutamates and, and other proteins in them might, might not be. Um, anyway. So, so how do we balance the two of you, I ask? How do, we, how do we think about the relationship between our investment in space colonization and whatever secondary benefits we might derive from it and our investments in the Earth environment? Do you see a place, a connection between those two? Or are you going to have to fight with the environmentalists because they want the resources just to fix things on Earth? Are, it's, is there some part of your job that says, no, some of this could really help on the other side of this, this research chain? Right, and I think that's true across NASA. Um, a lot of the things that we're doing and the fact that we're trying, everything we make, we have to figure out how to do it with less resources. And so in the end, a lot of that technology, even, you know, when working with industry and working with academia and, and working directly at NASA, is going to have ways that it can transfer um, to the world today because we are always pushing to get better at doing that. Now, I've said multiple times that I think the world's first trillionaire is the person who figures out how to exploit the resources on asteroids and comets. So is NASA thinking about that creatively as part of the in situ resource utilization? Space has unlimited resources, basically. It's just you just need access to it. Or are you still just worried about what you bring and what you might be able to grow on, on the spot? Those kinds of um, investigations are going on together. So uh, in the beginning, we probably will have to bring a lot more, but eventually the goal would be self-sustainability and earth independence. And to get there, you need to be looking at these other things and proving them out because it's a huge jump to go to that. And we need to show on the lunar surface and then on the Mars surface that these things are working and we can depend on them. Because the worst thing that could happen is you're depending on your food growing and then it doesn't grow. So you want to make sure that you have food. Just add poop and it grows just fine. Yes, we learned that on Mars. The poop potatoes. <laughs> yes. The poopy, the Can we talk potatoes. about the Martian now? Can we talk <laughs> about <laughs> it? <laughs> the movie, the Martian. <laughs> but but aren't, aren't the things that you're, you're talking about, I mean, that's basically life on Earth in a microcosm. Limited resources, limited space, limited energy. That's what you said. And we're out in the middle of space all freaking alone. So it's kind of the same thing. So, NASA, save us. <laughs> Except, Alton, you can breathe the air here. That's, you know, the air. Well, now. <laughs> Today. So, NASA is famous for how visible its achievements are relative to its budget. You know, and I used to joke that uh, how much, you know, people say, why are we spending money in space and not on Earth? I said, how much do you think they're getting in space of it as a fraction of the tax dollar? They'll come up with 10%, 15%, and then I tell them, no, it's, it's four-tenths of one cent. And they, so I keep thinking, NASA should get the budget that people think they're getting. <laughs> that would be amazing, right? So, so it's a testament to how visible NASA's achievements are 
because people think its budget is much greater than it is. Given that fact, uh, what are some of the future plans to, for education or, uh, uh, I read something about participation, crowdsourcing, some of the future NASA projects. What, what can you tell us about that? Uh, so we are actually in this area, in the food area. Um, th we're exploring uh, releasing a challenge to the public, to academia and industry to help us with these food challenges. Because Money. Right. So they you would it would be incentivized challenges. We're looking at Money. out a centennial challenge with cash prizes. Thank you. And um <laughs> <laughs> And so basically the goal is we need safe, acceptable, and nutritious food that reduces resource use on these long duration missions. And we don't have a food system that can do that right now. And we are investigating a lot of the technologies that already exist, but we're always looking for new technologies. What is the next cutting edge gonna be? So we're looking at releasing this challenge to the public um, sometime next year and trying to get um, to provide those incentives. And these kinds of challenges can also help, um, you know, create the next generation of scientists and the next generation, uh, generation of engineers and uh, keep NASA and the United States as a leader in science technology. Is there a hashtag or a Twitter? I mean, what, 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 how is this getting out there? So it is, um, if, if you watch the website, nasa.gov slash solve, solve, then solve. you'll be able to see when this challenge is released. Oh, okay. That's a smart idea. If there's one thing America is like, it's doing a food contest and getting money. <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to just give him a big T-shirt. Like. Ultimate baking space <laughs> challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and now, and now, <laughs> from space. <laughs> well, has NASA ever done that before? Yes, NASA does these challenges um, in different areas. What came out of the last one? You know, off the top of your head, what? they did a 3D printing of houses. Um, and that one had some pretty interesting, you know, looking at 3D printing your habitat. Right. And 3D printing of houses can actually um, have a lot of applications. In Got the it. So the real value here is, like the X Prize, is if you put up a cash prize for the winner, that the people who compete are all putting up their own money to compete for that cash prize. So what you're really getting is the sum of everyone's investment as a... R&D magnifier on what the final product will become. It's an extraordinary system that it actually works. And there are some cases where the people will spend more money than what the prize will be just to win. And then they get the visibility and the fame and the, and the, and, and the attention. So, uh, so I, I, I wish you luck on this, uh, you and NASA. Then it's not luck, I wish you um, uh, all the innovation that you deserve, and that comes your way. <laughs> yep. So we need to land this plane. Sorry, we need to land this rocket. Um, is there uh, just, uh, Alton, do you have any sort of parting thoughts for us? Um, yeah, I, I think that. By the way, you have a resting grumpy face. I just wanted you to know. If, it, if no one told you that, I just want to tell you. It's because I ate those beans. <laughs> uh, the beans were very, very good. Um, I, I think that um, if I was going to have anything uh, here to, to wrap up, it's that everybody needs to pay a heck of a lot of attention to what they put in their pie hole. Um, we need to be very watchful of what we're doing. We need to be more aware of where it's coming from, who's growing it, how far it's being shipped, and what kind of resources go into it. Um, that means we're going to have to do a lot more work. We have to do more due diligence about what we eat uh, because it has a very, very specific and direct um, effect on, on uh, what kind of resources we're going to have to work with, to win X prizes with, or to colonize the rest of space with. We do have to maintain home, um, and we need to be better at it. Dr. Grace. Any, any parting thoughts for us this evening? Well, I think it's pretty incredible that um, we've had crew living in spaceflight consecutively now for um, almost 20 years. And one of the things that we do know is that they all want to eat something different, and food is incredibly important. So uh, it's definitely something we need to consider as our challenges for resources um, and our shelf life uh, requirements become longer. 
uh, we really need to consider how are we going to solve this in a way where we're supporting our crew's health and performance. Um, because in the end, you know, as humans, we like to explore. And what we're doing at NASA is really what we're doing as a, a, as a country. So this, you know, this is for all of us. And what comes out of this is going to benefit all of us. Cool. Thank you for that. Jordan, Jordan, after your rodent-eating recitation a yeah. few moments ago, I'm a little afraid to ask your final thought. Neil, don't, don't fear me. <laughs> you know, I was moved today. I think uh, I will watch the things I put in my mouth. I think that is a good thing to, to walk away from this with. Uh, I've been uh, part of the reason some of the things we've talked about in the past is sort of my love of NASA and uh, uh, American ingenuity. And I think here one of your stories, documentaries was, was we, all we, about we NASA. covered NASA and yes. whether or not we're going to go to Mars and like how you can invest in something like that. And uh, the, the, the byproduct of that can be so good for a culture like us. And so uh, it's good to be a part of conversations like this because it, it gives me optimism. I think if we could put a man on the moon and if we can called the number one restaurant in the world, a restaurant that serves ant paste, then I kind of think <laughs> we could maybe attack some of these problems we talked about There's here hope, today. isn't there? There's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, excellent. Thank, thank you, Jordan. <laughs> but, so, Jordan, I, I think I'm a little older than you, so my generation says, if we can pit on man on the moon, we can do anything. You're saying, if we can make lemon paste out of ants, we can do anything. I think so, yes. That's, that's, that's a lower bar, I think. Well, I think my generation, that's where we set our bars. <laughs> can I talk about politics now? No, no, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Nope. We're good. Um, uh, if I can offer some reflections on this evening. First, I, I was immensely enlightened by all that each of you contributed, um, as well as Ariel Johnson earlier. and. Uh, it's interesting, when you look at sort of the history of human conflict, uh, apart from religious wars and political wars, uh, one of the sources of conflict was access to resources. Sometimes those resources are water, sometimes it's food, arable land, and so much of what we discussed regarding food is not food that separates us, it, it's food that brings us together. The fact that the different countries on the International Space Station. That's what the I stands for. It's international. Mm -hmm. We'll come together and share food because we're all human and we all eat multiple times a day. So that this, this fact, which we have turned into ritual, and ritual is such a fundamental part of what it is to be human, I'm wondering whether our shared challenge of making sure Earth does not die under our feet. Because if Earth dies under our feet, it doesn't affect just one country and not another, it affects everybody. That's why we call it global climate change. We're all in this together. So I, I'm imagining a future where maybe there are no wars because our survival depends on each other. And we being shepherds of the earth to nourish civilization going forward. And in that future, every country is around a table sharing food prepared from all over the globe. And that would be sort of my vision of eternal peace in this world. Thank you all. Thank you. Jordan Kepler, thank you. Yes. Ariel Johnson in the back. Grace Douglas. Now, where's Ariel? Come on out. Ariel. Alton Brown. I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And as always, from Star Talk, we bid you to keep looking up. Thank you. Thank you for the panel.